Let's pray together. God, we ask that it is you we hear and feel in these words and in this place. Amen. Amen. So if you've been reading along and believe, this is an exciting time because we just did chapter 20, which means we are two-thirds of the way through this book. And we're about to get to the part of the book that tells us who we should be becoming, what we should be doing. Um, And that's a very exciting part of the book. But really, what's most exciting probably about getting this far is that when you look at it, look how much we've read. There's only this much left. That's got to be exciting, right? This is the point in the book where you just read to the end. You don't even go to bed, right? You just stay up and keep reading because you get so into it. That's about where we are in this. So that's very exciting. And today, we're going to talk about sharing our faiths. But before we get to that, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and I want you to just shout out your answers, okay? Can we do that? Okay, I want someone to tell me who their favorite musician is. Glenn Miller. That was quick. Why? Music, attitude, treated family. Did I misspell that? Okay, just making sure. My spelling's pretty bad. I want someone to tell me who their favorite sports team is. Indians. I heard Indians. I heard Cavs. The Cubs? Oh, no. We're lucky Matt's not here. He probably would have yelled out Steelers. Ugh. Why? They're local. Fun to watch. Winners. Winners. Who yelled that? Okay. I want someone to tell me who their favorite school teacher is or was. Who? What was the name? Lyman? L-Y-P-E. Why? He must have been. I mean, that came to you like that. Okay. What's your favorite color? What's your favorite hymn? Who's your favorite actor? What's your favorite number? Wow, I just found out this week that adults have favorite numbers. I was asked that. And I don't have a favorite number. No number like jumped out of me. I didn't know that was a thing still, but it is. Okay, so this this week we've been reading a chapter that's all about sharing. And we just did a bunch of sharing this morning, right? But I want someone to tell me something else. What do you believe? took a bit longer for someone to say something, huh? The laughter died away. Why do you believe that? So we have a couple people that are talking, that are sending out some examples, but it's not as loud and as boisterous as it just was, was it? Why... Why is it easier to talk about these fairly pointless things in our life. Easier to share and talk about that than it is to talk about faith. What we believe and why. I think there are a lot of reasons on why it might be easier and why it might be tougher to share our faith. But really, in my studies this past week, I think it boils down to two things. Sharing our faith requires a number of things, but there are two parts of it that we really don't like. And that is that we must listen and we must be uncomfortable. To share our faiths, we have to do both those things. We have to listen and we're going to be uncomfortable. The key question for this week in the chapter is, quote, how do I share my faith with those who don't know God? How do you even come to know if someone doesn't know God? Can you just look at them and tell 
We might like to think we can, but I doubt it. We have to listen. I believe there are people sitting in churches right now who don't know God. But nobody has taken the time to listen to know that these people are present, hurting, and looking for something more. So we have to ask, how do you share your faith? I mean, it was really easy to share about ourselves, but how do you, how do you share your faith? Hmm? By example? How you live? That's good. How you live. It does. It starts with us, actually. It really does start with us. And this is probably the easier part. It's you share your story. To share your faith, you must share your story. Who are you? How do you live? How did you get to this moment in your life? All of the companion material for this series says that we have to start here, but it leaves out a very important aspect to this. And that is, if you're effectively sharing your story, then you must be listening to their story. You have to be in dialogue. You can't just speak to. That won't resonate. And this part really is the easiest part because mainly you are all a bunch of friendly people, aren't you? Right? If you think you're friendly, raise your hand. If you think you're humble, no, I'm just kidding. We are, we're a bunch of friendly people, so we just have to be ourselves. I want to show you how easy it is really to share a story. One of the assignments we had in, uh, in divinity school is that we had to write a story about ourselves and then share it in our hom- homiletics class. And so I'm going to share with you the story that I wrote uh, for that class. The day I narrowly avoided being gored was just another summer day. My neighborhood was bordered by some woods, and on the other side of the woods, there was a cow pasture, and surrounding this pasture was an electric fence. Now, my friend Alex and I, well, we decided that we should try to pet the calves in this field, because that's what you would do on a normal summer day. As we approached the pasture, we looked upon a sea of serene cows and their calves, and we paused for a moment to take in this scene, and I turned to Alex and said, are you sure there aren't any bulls here? And he smirked and responded, it's a dairy farm. They don't need bulls. Maybe we should have taken health class a second time. I should have called him on his bull, but instead I said, well, I'm pretty sure that one in the distance has horns. He shook his head and we proceeded. And as we approached the laying heifers, we discovered that they were afraid of us and were much quicker than anticipated. It's not easy to pet a calf. The commotion we caused quickly turned the benevolent bovines into a cacophony of cantankerous cows, and in the chaos we were unaware of the bull closing in on us. We were in the steer's sight, and he was gaining a head of steam. I began to hear some thundering thuds that were louder than the scampering cows, and turned just in time to see the beast bearing down on us. I yelled a profanity. Yeah, that's right, I used to cuss. I yelled a profanity, and I spun to run toward the fence, and like Casey in the infamous bottom of the ninth, I was looking to go deep, way back and over that fence. Alex saw me running, and he took off too. The bull had the angle on us exiting from the clearing in which we came, so we only had one option, the jump fence into the biggest bush of barbs I've ever seen. And just as the bull lowered his head and kicked it into his highest gear, we jumped, hoping to make it, and one of us did with ease. Alex cleared the fence and landed into the bush where it was thin enough for him to weigh down the branches. As I jumped, time slow. Though running forward, I was looking back and hoping that with the horns closing in, I would escape without a new hole in my rear. And I landed, and the steer came to a skidding stop with his head hanging over the electric fence. Myself painfully land in the prickles and released a sigh. My relief was short-lived, however, as I began to feel the bush push back against me. I slowly moved closer to the bull against my will. I was close enough to the beast to feel the bull's breath. The moistness of the snorts and sniffs created a mist of fear that hung around me. 
Would the bull stay on that side of the fence? How long can I stay still in a bush that has cut into me dozens upon dozens of times? At that moment, I did not feel the pain, only the fear of being found guilty in the eyes of the singular judge and jury staring me down. Over the next hour or so, the bull moved slowly backward. I finally ran for it. I darted back under the fence and ran to the clearing where we entered. After I left, the bull receded, and Alex ran for the opening too. It was at this point that we removed the many half-inch to two-inch thorns throughout our bodies and clothing, and returned home in time for dinner. It's actually pretty easy to talk about ourselves, right? That was one of the most fun assignments I had in all of divinity school. It's easy to share our experience. Whenever Alex and I get together, we crack up about these stories of what started like a normal summer day, and then we did something stupid. But it's not just about sharing our story, right? That's, that's a pretty easy part. Here's the next part. Second, we don't just stop with our story. We share God's story. How do we do that? What do you believe? So I've shared a story about myself. So I'll share with you my faith. I believe that the God of the Bible is the one true God, that God is found in Creator Christ, Holy Spirit, and more, that the Scriptures are alive and speak to us today. I believe we have been blessed with an intellect to accompany our faith so that we might best understand God's movements in this world. I believe that Christ came for all, that one died for all, and that all means all. I believe everyone is loved, accepted, and forgiven by God. And I believe in the restoration of God's kingdom will, where all will be whole in the presence of God. This is God's story that I am called to share. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we are all called to share. Paul writes, Christ has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. God needs us to show people this reconciliation to share God's story. This sharing God's story, sharing scripture with others, speaking about how Christ is alive in your life to others, this is the uncomfortable part. This is probably the hardest part of sharing our faiths. Our scripture this morning, we heard the last two chapters of Jonah. And in Jonah, we, hear, we heard about how he didn't want to go and preach to Nineveh, but he did so reluctantly. Do we know why he didn't want to go and preach to them? He didn't like them. Hmm? It wasn't just that they were evil, but he also knew the nature of God. And he knew that God would listen to the Ninevites if they repented. That God would offer this reconciliation even to Jonah's enemies. And Jonah didn't want to listen at all. He went and he did his peace very reluctantly and he was fed up. And nobody really came to God through Jonah being the model of what to do. That's not why this story is in Scripture. It's there as a reminder of how God's desires are sometimes different than our own. At the very end, in the book of Jonah, we get this great interaction between Jonah and God. Where God says to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? This is the bush that God brought and then had a worm eat it and died. And Jonah said, Yes, angry enough to die. I think Jonah's a teenager, maybe, in this. And then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and it perished in a night. Should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? Just because Jonah doesn't like them doesn't mean that they are left out of God's love of God's reconciliation. 
God's love is much bigger than our human understanding. I read a story about a young teenage boy who had just gotten his driver's license, and when he got home, he asked his father, who was a minister, if they could discuss the use of the car. And so the father looks at the, looks at the boy and says, I'll make a deal with you. If you bring up your grades, study your Bible a little, and get a haircut, then I'll talk, we can talk about the use of the car. After about a month, the boy came back again and asked his father if they could discuss the use of the car. And again, the father looked at him and said, Son, I've been so very proud of you. You've gotten your grades up. You've studied the Bible diligently, but you still didn't get a haircut. The young man waited a moment and replied, But Dad, I've been thinking about that. You know, Samson had long hair. Moses had long hair. Noah had long hair. Even Jesus had long hair. And his father interrupted him at that point and said, Yes, son. And they walked everywhere they went. Often we share our faiths only when it's convenient to us and when we want someone else to get what we want them to get out of Scripture or out of their relationship with God. But really, sharing our faiths requires that we let God's love take control to bring about the spirit of reconciliation displayed in in Nineveh and called for by Paul. This past week, our daughters were playing in the living room while Tara and I were prepping some food in the kitchen So we could hear them, but we weren't really seeing what they were doing. And suddenly, one of them burst out into song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The other one interrupted and said, hey, 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 hey. That's not just your song. I know that song from church too. And together they belted Jesus loves me at the top of their lungs in our living room. So my question to you is, Do you believe the words of that song? Do you know the words of that song? Do you believe them? Do you believe that Jesus loves you? This isn't rhetorical. Do you believe that Jesus loves you? Do you believe that your neighbor should believe those words too? Do you believe that Jesus loves her? Do you believe that your enemy should believe those words too? Do you believe that Jesus loves him? Then don't hold back. Don't be afraid. Don't hold back sharing your faith. Sing that song. I know you got a quick preview of it. The words are going to be up on the screen so you can remember them. Let's sing that simple song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is... I can't really hear you. Yes, Jesus loves me. Come on. Yes, Jesus loves me. Do you believe that? Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Were you afraid to sing that song? That is the kind of fearlessness we need to share our faiths. It's the same fearlessness that Jesus had when he sought out the woman at the well and brought many to faith through her. The same fearlessness he had when he said to his disciples in the crowds, let the children come to me for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The same fearlessness when he wouldn't walk around a town to avoid the crowds. And the same fearlessness to say to God, if at all possible, take this cup from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. We need that fearlessness to not be worried about being uncomfortable in sharing our faiths, that fearlessness of Christ to effectively share our faiths, where we can pause and listen to those around us, share our story, share God's story, and ultimately share our faiths to fulfill God's purposes of reconciling us all. Pastor Rand Frazee closes this section in his book, and I want to share this with you, his closing thoughts. He says, I once heard a story about a man who attended an art show. He was amazed at the life-size statue of his lion. The details and scale were incredible. The man approached the sculptor who was standing nearby and asked, How in the world were you able to fashion a lion so detailed out of a block stone? 
And the artist smiled slyly and answered, Well, it's easy, really. I simply chipped away everything that did not look like a lion. God is methodically and continually chipping away everything on us that doesn't look like his son. He is continually shaping and molding each of us into Christ's image. God's goal is by the time we leave this world and enter his, we look as much like Christ as possible. And once we enter heaven, we receive our glorified bodies and are fully formed into his image. But as we've repeatedly stated, the reason to become like him now is so that we can influence as many of our neighbors as possible to join us in his kingdom and on this journey. And so now we will be transitioning to this next section in the book, the what should we do practices. And there are some practices that show the primary actions of Jesus, those movements of his we should mimic, and those activities that will keep us becoming more and more like Jesus so that we can more effectively share our faiths. Amen.